Hi everyone, it's David here, and just to let you know about our live show in London, if you're down south or fancy a wee trip to the Big Smoke, then come and see us as we host our live show at the Leicester Square Theatre on the 21st of March. And you might not be too keen to see us, but I'm sure you'll be keen to see our special guest, Paul Gascoigne. He's coming here, Gaza, really, some of his amazing moments at his time at the jail. So if you want tickets, go to the Leicester Square Theatre website, just Google Leicester Square Web uh, Theatre at Gaza and up it will pop so Thursday 21st of March it's an international break there's nothing else happening we hope to see you there take care everybody bye bye Hello everyone and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar and I am your host as always. I am also pretty much all you've got this week because of course there was no game yesterday after the farce of a call-off up at Dundee. Uh, Not the call-off that was the farce, it was the fact the pitch was in that condition in the first place. So what to do, what to do, because obviously we don't want to leave you content less uh, this week. So I decided I would ask our chief executive tier over on our Patreon on Heart and Hand to supply some questions and I'll chat through them and hopefully entertain you for the next 40 minutes or so. So let's get straight into the questions. First one comes from Derek Johnston. He says, of all your various trips since taking on the press role, Davy, what's been your most favourite one and why? Oh, that that's a very interesting one. Um, I think Dortmund away was was brilliant because it was just chaos. We got to the airport and they say, "Oh, the the weather's bad. You might not be able to go." Um, and then our flight went, um, and and Schiphol was just total chaos because Europe was even worse. It was a massive storm, but we 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 get to Dortmund and then. Just as we're getting into the ground, this famous ground, the Westfalen Stadion, you know, always wanted to go there. And uh, the, the the news comes that our flights have been cancelled home the next day. All flights out of Europe were off because it's a massive storm and it was just tough titty, basically. So, you know, you're sitting there thinking, right, OK, well, what are we going to do here? <laughs> um, but then the game starts and I thought, right, hell, wait, watch the game. And then this, this thing, this incredible crazy nuts 90 minutes unfolded with rangers winning 4-2 going 3-0 up uh early in the second half then they score to make it for jude bellingham of course who i think is currently in the running for best player in the world and you think right well whatever crazy magic sustained this it's now finished but we ran up straight out of the park and made it 4-1 and it was just wild and then you know after the game uh, I had no flight, I had no luggage because uh, they'd lost my, my luggage uh, on the way over. So there I was in Germany, stuck, uh, no no flight home, no luggage, and I couldn't give a fuck uh, because I was just high as a kite after seeing Rangers um, gub Borussia Dortmund in their own midden. So yeah, that one for me. Remember, I'm a child of the 90s, European games but especially European ways were generally really painful so I, I still take probably a great deal maybe more pleasure and maybe some of the younger bears who understandably are more yeah I think we're all a wee bit focused on domestic success but I, I still remember European games being a nightmare and to watch Rangers go out there and actually make us proud time after time which which they've done continually over the, the last six years really um, I think is is very special. Michael Thompson, given Dessers has picked the run-in to revert back to his default hopeless self, are we going to live to rue not signing a striker in the January window? Well, we'll only we'll only know that come come the summer. Uh, I I did think it was strange. I said on here that I thought it was strange. For me, it was the number one target, but the manager obviously didn't agree. Um, he wanted to to strengthen in in other areas. Although, of course, when when we've asked the manager about this. Um, he has said, well, we signed Fabio Silva, who's a striker, and he sees him as a number nine. I think maybe, you know, we as a support were, were expecting a more traditional number nine, but I think the manager wants to play a slightly different way. It would be good if Kemar Roof can can just step up these last few weeks. Look, let's face it, he's highly, highly unlikely to be offered a new contract. If Rangers offer Kemar Roof a new contract, 
then they need their heads looked at. It really is that simple because you just can't justify keeping about a guy who regularly cannot play football. But if he was to sign off by, by just coming back in and, and really propelling us over the line, then I think you find a lot of fans would, would look back on his time here a lot a lot more fondly, you know, rather than the first thing people say about him is, oh, he was always injured, people might go, I mind him when, when he fired this to the treble, and then he was always injured, but who cares, he fired this to the treble, so that's the challenge there, and, and hopefully he'll be able to do his a turn in that regard. Damien Stubbs, I'll try and word this as articulately and with as few swear words as possible. From your experience and knowledge, David, what can realistically done, be done about the shit show that runs, governs our game in Scotland? Are we doing anything? Could we do anything different in your opinion? Thanks, mate. Be intrigued to hear your input. Uh, right. The first thing about it is, is the reason it continues, the governance of the SPFL, being the way it is and being so bad as it is, is that the clubs allow it to. And Rangers, as as disappointing as it might be, only have one vote. Now, Rangers have made it very clear, uh, time after time, they think that the SPFL needs a change in leadership, change in governance, and needs to be run better. Um, the problem is, is that they don't have enough votes for other clubs. Now, there's one club in particular who are quite happy with the status quo because it's the, that's the status quo that they have set up. And I think it's been quite clear for a while that Celtic are quite prepared and, and happy enough to just be you know, king of the ashes, basically. Um, the, the product can get worse, it can get shitter, they can get more embarrassing in Europe, which they have been for 20 years now. It doesn't matter as long as they're winning domestically, that's all they care about. Um, and that's fair enough, incidentally, that's not for me to criticise. Um, the, their responsibility is to themselves, it's not to the greater good of the game. But the problem is, is that all the clubs in Scotland take that approach. And I think that's led us to, to where we are now in Scotland. There's no appetite to change it. And I think that, that sometimes we as Rangers fans, I see it a lot when people, the club should do something about this. And and it comes from a good place. It comes from a place of this is obviously wrong and therefore there must be a way to solve it. Because if you grow up believing in fairness, then that's that's always the situation. Um, and I, it, it, can, it can be quite challenging when you realise, oh hang on, there is very little you can do about this because there's no appetite for change among the other clubs. They're continually happy to get low ball money in, they're continually happy to get the piss taken out of them by Doncaster. Any other business, Neil Doncaster doesn't survive various fuck ups. You know, the the, the lack of a sponsor more than once for the league would see a chief executive go the first time it happened he'd have been gone. You know, that that's the thing. Uh, it, you can only be a victim of incompetence with this situation if you consent to being a victim of incon incompetence. And unfortunately for Rangers, we don't, but everyone else, uh, well, not enough, don't. And it, it, it really is a case that some of the clubs need to just stand up and say, right. And of course, one of the issues is that fans will bleat and bleat and bleat. Fans of other clubs will bleat about things. And then when we go, yeah, we agree with you, they'll go, all right, screw, we don't want to be agreeing with the with the Rangers supporters, and it's just so fucking backwards, it's untrue. But then you look at the game in Scotland, and it is so backwards. Look at the pitch situation yesterday, that's ridiculous for a, a Premier League pitch. can happen occasionally in a top league, but four times a season, nah. Um, and it's, you know, the teams that deliberately have bad pitches so that they get an advantage... You've got, you know, the the style of football that gets played by most teams, and it, it is, it's becoming shitter and shitter, and, and my worry has always been that in terms of, you know, attracting next generation of fans into the game, um, it, I think it must be difficult for parents when you've got this big glamorous behemoth down south that's three hours drive away some of the clubs, you know, um, and you're saying to them, no, we, we don't support that, we support this up here which is cold and depressing and wet and everyone fighting and arguing and, you know, nothing positive ever happens in it. So um, that is a concern of mine for the future. But the SPFL don't do future, do they? Douglas Ennis, should Rangers have an option on when the rescheduled Dundee game takes place? Yeah, both clubs should. Um, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, that does include Dundee. But uh, I think that, you know, Rangers should certainly have an input as to, to when it takes place. 
as the manager said yesterday, it's going to lead to us potentially having a, a Celtic having a week before an Old Firm game rather than us, and that that is an advantage, and it's one that that could be changed to to be a wee bit more fair. But that's why it was a bit of a pain in the the backside getting it getting it called off yesterday. Doogie, hi David. Uh, with today's postponement, a good or a bad thing? I'm looking at it from a glass half full view. Potentially more Rangers players back from injury, etc. Yeah, I mean, look, the, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is subjective. It's it's a thing. It happened, and we just have to deal with it. Now, the negative side of it is it was been great to get the game played, we go back top of the league, not have this fixture issue that, that was just referred to in the last question, but, um, but it wasn't played. So for me, I'm not a you know, glass half full, glass half empty person, although I think most people who listen to this say I'm, I'm maybe tend towards it being half full, but I, I, I'm just more of a practical person that, that kind of goes, well, the game has been postponed, right? So there's no point discussing what would have happened if it hadn't. It, it didn't take place yesterday. Where does that leave us, right? It leaves us, as you say, in a situation where we have another game to play, but we will have more players back for it. So it kind of balances it, but you know, life happens, you just need to get on with it, don't you? And uh, we're no difference. There's a great question for me and Miller. The Lundstrom conundrum, you contract or not? Oh, he's three years younger? I don't even think it's a question. But he isn't. And he's going to be looking for a big contract because it's probably his last decent one and he'll want the security and I can't blame him for that. Do we really want to be tied down? Because the reality of the situation is that John Lundstrom is not likely to get better during the course of this contract. If anything, he's more likely, just because of age, to slow down a little. Right? I'm not saying, by the way, he's going to be totally useless or lame by the end of it, but uh, it, I, I would probably tend... On, on, on his form, yes, absolutely. But I think we've made bad decisions the, the last few years in terms of contract. I don't think we've been um, good at, at saying making tough decisions, and the John Lundstrom one is a tough decision. However, my view on it is irrelevant because the manager absolutely loves him and wants John Lundstrom in his side next season, uh, and if he can get a deal that's acceptable across, then he'll be happy to do that. So, yeah, I think you, you do need to trust Phil on it. I, I think I've just seen so often Rangers sign a guy who's kind of later on in his career on a three or a four year deal and then by midway through the contract you're kind of um, but you can't then move the player on and you're committed to the wage and that has happened to us time after time so I do think that we need to be better at making tough decisions where you say right okay you know, he's a very good player and but it's time for us to move on to another option you know the trading model that they keep talking about well the trading model suggests you let John Lundstrom go and you bring in a younger player into that position that's what the trading model suggests um but like I say you know the manager might look at it and say nah he's and there are other things that I don't consider I, I look at it purely from what I see on a pitch a manager has to look at dressing room and influence and you know training pitch etc and John Lundstrom he's spoken about repeatedly as being one of his leaders so look if Phil wants him I'm okay with that me personally I would probably move towards someone younger in the summer that's not to say by the way that you sign you know, a squad full of guys that are under 23, you know, that's great in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. You do need leaders, and if John Lundstrom had another year on his deal, he would be playing for me next season. I'm just saying that it's slightly different. Unless, of course, you can persuade him to take, you know, a deal with, you know, a, a two years, and then that's a different thing. But from the player's point of view, if he's offered a four-year deal somewhere, he has to take it. You know, the, the security and the stability, I totally understand that. And I think sometimes we can get a bit annoyed at players doing the best for themselves and their families, and, and I, I tend not to, because they're human beings. David Clapperton asks, with Hibs being the latest team to say they're cutting their way allocation, it's becoming clear that non-old firm teams now don't consider it essential revenue every season to have us in their ground. That being the case, is league expansion back on the table, as this was always the reason why it wouldn't happen, we were told, although we all know it's because we're the only show in town where Sky is concerned. Surely a bigger league is now a month. We're scheduled to play Hearts in a few games for the fifth and sixth time this season. That can't be healthy for any serious football nation. Cheers. 
No, David, you're absolutely right. It isn't healthy. It's boring and it's repetitive and it's really, really, you know, frustrating and annoying. And it, it takes away the specialness of big games. If you look at, you know, when you watch uh, England or Spain or Italy, the big games are big because you get them twice a year. Well, maybe a cup, but but you get them twice a year. We're a smaller country, um, unfortunately, and we, we have an awful lot of teams. I mean, let's be honest, if we're being realistic, Dundee should have one team in it, right? Because they've only got the support for one team in it. Now, I'm not before any people who live in the Dundee area are, are saying I'm suggesting a merger. I remember what happened when Wallace Mercer suggested it. Um, but, you know, we have an awful lot of sides. Uh, I do think a bigger league would, would be better. The argument that's put forward is the four old firm games, which, you know, you could still organise a split, I think, where you, you still get that. And with cups, you're going to get that anyway. And I think the the other argument, which is, well, there's loads of meaningless games that happen. As exciting as you might think the split is, lads, there are a lot of meaningless games that happen as it is at the moment. In fact, you might argue that, you know, for about four or five teams, because not, they're not going to get into Europe and they're not going to get relegated. So the whole campaign really seems a bit pointless. But I, I would be in favour of it. It wouldn't happen, though. No. Davy Stewart, hi David, hope you're well and having a good day. I am, thank you. No one ever asked me that, um, but uh, thank you. I appreciate that, Davy. Dundee, that's a few times I've seen they've had to postpone a fixture due to their pitch not being playable. Do you think the SPFL should be punishing clubs, especially in the top flight, that can't keep their pitch to the required standard? It's a bloody nightmare. You just know the replay will be between Hibs and Celtic game. Watch this space. What about the game being forfeited or Dundee deducted points where it's been awarded the win or would a fine be a simple enough punishment? What is your opinion? I think you kick off... Firstly, apparently there is a rule, right? It's just not enforced, which is so fucking typical of Scottish football that it hurts. Um, I think, secondly, the yes, clubs should be punished. Um, not for a postponement. It can happen. Absolutely it can. It would be very harsh, for example, if there's a massive storm that's you know being predicted and we're all being told about it and it's all over the news and you have to avoid essential journey, journeys and batten down the hatches and a game gets called off and the club get fined, that's unfair. But when you have a regular issue with a pitch, then yes. And I wouldn't go straight to forfeiting games. I think there could be a build-up, happens the first time and then you don't rectify it within a set amount of time. Then you know you go from, from a fine to you know maybe, as you say, you know like getting something further, maybe forfeiting a point or whatever, I don't know, points deduction um, seems very popular at the moment in England, points deductions, don't they? But yeah, so I, I think so, I, to me it goes back to the fact that there are some teams in the SPFL who deliberately have terrible pitches because they think it suits them and again it goes back to well, what sort of product do you have and you can't really blame the club because again their responsibility is to themselves but that's why you need a bigger organisation i.e. The, the SPFL, that's why you need someone who can take the wider view, supposedly the overview and say we understand why you're doing this you know, to gain an advantage but it's terrible for the game up here, it's terrible for the product, uh, you're not being able to do it. So St Johnston, you have to actually get a fucking groundsman in and not have a pitch that regularly looks as though that somebody's been on it earlier on doing wheelies, right? That that has to go. Um, you'd get rid of the terrible plastic pitches as well, especially plastic pitches like Armonville that still get call-offs. So, yeah, it, it's again a failure of leadership and a failure of governance, but that's Scottish football in a nutshell. Similar question uh, came in from Glasgow Bear. He, he is in favour of forfeiting the matches. John Smith, hi David. On the spot, you get to pick any two teams in history to play a game for you. Who do you choose? I choose the 50s Heartside versus the Barca Bears. Uh, I'd probably like to see... That's a really, really good one. Um... Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably go back and, and see a side who I hadn't seen, you know, like, so so I started watching football in the early 80s, started watching Rangers in the early 80s, so I'd, I'd probably like to go back and see maybe um, the the Rangers side of, you know, the Barca Bears side, or maybe actually even, no, I'd like to go back and see the 60s Rangers team with Jim Baxter in. Um, that was the one that I was kind of weaned on stories as as a kid that that never 
quite achieved its potential because back to left. Um, so I, I would be, I'd like to see that side. And who would I have them up against? I'd have them up against another Rangers side. I'd have them up against Rangers 92-93. There you go. So my favourite Rangers side versus a Rangers side I wish I'd seen. They're my two teams. James Curran, Davey, any further updates on the stadium uh, and on upgrades to the stadium and surrounding land? I'm aware of the new seats and disabled area. Is there any concrete plans nice, to fill in the corners, for example? No, there isn't. So, no. If you haven't heard about it, there are no plans to do it. It's that simple. Um, anything like that that isn't being spoken about is a pipe dream at the moment. Um, it would take an awful lot of investment to do it. And that's the drawback. Also, the fact that it to do major work can, not always, but can mean that you have a reduction in stadium capacity during that, so it's a sort of chicken-egg thing. But no, no, um, it, it, it's something that comes up a lot. The club would love to, to you know, make, make the capacity bigger because they know they would sell it, and that's that's the reason for it. Um, it's about a question about securing that investment and how to do it. It would have to be a long-term project, and at the moment where it's all hands on deck to try and make sure that we're, We've got a winning team on the pitch first, then I think things like this are nice to do, but they're not quite the highest priority at the moment. Hopefully you get a wee spell of succession, you say, right, time now to, to look into this. But uh, I think that if you look at when projects are, are done, building projects, they generally never really go to the time scale and to the cost that, that people say. So... No, but but yeah, generally there's no secret plans in the background that are happening. There may be discussions about look how feasible is this? Could could we do this? But until it's announced, it hasn't got any further than that. Ian McMahon, I think the manager made a good point about us having standards for lighting, etc. Um, but does anyone check the standards for drainage? In some ways, today's game being called off is not the worst as we get to move more players. Hopefully, we will get some more players back in international break and push on for the rest of the season. I agree, Ian. William Alston, do you think that the club have any thoughts about changing their stance on the dignified silence approach to refs as they must be aware the current approach isn't working? Well, the club did come out. And and that's the thing when people talk about, oh, the club will never say anything. Well, they did. They came out after the old fun game and it didn't work. Um, this is the, 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 the problem that you have. You know, you, you could come out and lambast them. But unlike when Celtic do it and the SFA and the refs go running and cower, when we do it, they came out fighting. So um, you could argue that it was actually counterproductive to do that. Personally, I think we need to highlight it a lot more than we do. I think we need to use the the ex-Rangers players in the media the way that Celtic use their ex-players in the media to do it. I think we need to get out there and be putting forward our case. One of the issues that you're getting at the moment is that the refereeing in general is fucking awful. And because of that, I think a lot of teams can feel picked on. Because let's face it, if you're a fan, you tend only to watch your team's games, really. So you just see this and you think, every week, it's every week. So it must be deliberate. Uh, some of the refs, by the way, though, right enough, get me get me worried about that. But I think we need to be out there demanding better standards every week. Um, and I think that it would be helpful if the other clubs could, could grow up and get together. The problem that you have with stuff like this is you've always got Celtic in the corner with a chip on the shoulder determined to play a victim card all the time. So it's only them that ever get a bad refereeing decision and they never get any refereeing decision. And for them to come out and be constructive is just not something that, that they, they just can't. It's not in their DNA to come out there, um, Celtic, uh, as a football club, to come out there and say, right, OK, you know, we accept there's an issue here and we want to work with other clubs to improve it. They just they, they don't do that. Um and that then makes a problem that they tend also to take the opposite view to anything. So Celtic don't want to discuss low refereeing standards because then it, it suggests that it's only them, it's not only them that suffer for it, and then that's their whole identity gone. You know, it's a club that's won 11 leagues in 12 years and there's a fucking conspiracy against them. Can you imagine if Borussia Dortmund fans um, were told, oh, by the way, there's a massive conspiracy in Germany to help you win the league? You know, they'd piss themselves laughing, and rightly so. Um, but in Scotland, uh, the, there are actually people who believe that. So I think that, that the club could do more. I think it needs to highlight it more. It needs to be careful how it does it, though, because 
as I say, that they, they did come out and it didn't work. So the next stage is to, to come out, I would say, and say, the rest are needing a hand here. And I would push really hard for professional refs. Because I've said this before and I stand by it. It's a stressful job. And if you're coming and doing it as a hobby, when it's so many people's livelihoods and there's so much money in the game these days and it's so important to so many people, it's not a hobby, it should be a job. And no matter what any of the refs say, when they're coming from finishing the day at the office or wherever it is that they work, and then they're, they're setting themselves to go and do no, that is not good enough. Goes back to everything in this league being tin pot. You know, guy taking off his suit and getting into his referee's uniform. Nah, come on. Um, And people say, well, they still make mistakes in England. The referees in England are on a different fucking planet to the referees up here. Don't don't fool yourself. Of course they make mistakes. Humans always do, right? But in terms of just your your basic 90 minutes, it's it's not even comparable. Uh, Moving on then. Uh, Gary Andrews says, "Hi, gents. Do you think the the ref- it's just me, Gary? Um, do you think the referee forfeits their fee if a game is abandoned pre them arriving at a stadium? As usual, the referee has to be like his courts before him, and it's all about him. Why did he need to inspect the pitch when it was clear before nine that it was unplayable, and another referee was already at the ground? Uh, can beat getting the game confirmed off as the first roundabout on the Kingsway? <laughs> nah, you're right. Um, I don't know in terms of the match fee. I would assume they don't. Um, or get." they'll get something for travelling I think it's the local ref doesn't especially a game that's on Sky that the local ref didn't want to be the guy to take the responsibility so I think he has said to the ref well I'm not sure you come and have a look at it and I understand that um, so I think that that's basically been what happened yesterday uh, Rona Bluebell hi David have you heard anything about the size of the budget PC may be given in the summer he's been fantastic it'd be great to see him given the tools to build something special for the next few years nah they're never going to talk about how much money they're going to spend ever it's just not going to happen. You'll get maybe the odd thing, and it'll be a subjective word. That that's what it might be. Always, oh, he's, he's got a good, he's got a sizable, he's got a you know that kind of thing. But no, no football club's going to come out and say we are spending twenty million this summer. Um, so no, it, it, you're not going to get that from. I hope. I think he's earned one. Um, and I think that the fact that he looks as though he's got his head screwed on in terms of the type of player we should be signing. Because, like I say, if I hear one more thing in a, an official thing from Rangers about trading model and then go, stop telling me about this and start fucking showing me it. Start showing me it working. Uh, I think I'll scream. Uh, Yako says, is it now time for minimum standards of pitches within the Scottish top flight? Yes. Yes, I think uh, it very much is. Stevie Batchel, that's a good question. Why did Rangers persevere with their approach to corners against Benfica on Thursday? They got caught a few times on the break before eventually losing the goal. Given that a few players were running on empty, it was a very dangerous approach and ultimately cost us. Um, I, I don't like our corners. Full stop. I don't think they're very good. I don't think Redvan hits a good one. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that other than that he's left-footed. Um, so I would be trying something different. I don't like the all outswinger diet either. I think you need to vary it and mix it up a little bit. Um, and I think you need to correct for weaknesses we have, which is we don't have anyone in, in who's a good attacking header of the ball. And before anyone mentions Goldson, how many times does he get to the ball and head it over the bar? So um, I think you need to correct for all of those things. The reason that the manager was asked about it and he said it comes from a mistake. Um, that's why we decided to to do it. If, if the mistake isn't made, um, and he, he mentioned Diamandi, then the goal doesn't happen. So it's a risk-reward thing when a manager is thinking that's what we're going to play um, and that's the way I want us to do it. And I think that he felt that the game was, was tight, that he had to, to go and push for it a little bit. But we make a mistake and we get caught. I'd probably, in a, a game that big at that stage, I'd go more cautious. But it, it didn't work for him that time. It's worked for him before. Um, but I do think that our, you know, the amount of corners we we get... Um, and look, the average for goals scored from corners is 3%, believe it or not. That's 3 out of 100. And people... that That's all teams worldwide. And people hear that and they go, no, it can't be true. It is true. It's 3%. But and ours is about that. But I think our three percent is slanted heavy earlier in the season because the last couple of months we have not looked dangerous from corners. So it is something I'd like to see us do more on. Um, the manager, when he's been asked about it, has said they just don't really have time to work on it because it's been game, 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 game. 
Um, so hopefully it's something that we'll see improve when we've got, you know, coming up now, when we'll have like a week between game and more importantly through the summer. Stevie Old says, Hi David, I recently read Davy Cooper's memorial statue was looking unkempt and run down. Do you think the club should be looking into moving it to Ibrox or contributing to the upkeep? I would certainly be in favour of having it moved to Ibrox. I don't understand why there's this sort of reticence to, to put statues up at Ibrox unless there's maybe something to do with the fact that they want to keep the John Gregg one special. I know that the Walt Smith one is coming, but you know anyone who's been to Euro stadiums abroad will know that they have no problems at all having... Uh, statues of their legends um, and I'd like to see that more but I know that I think we would all be happy to 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 contribute what we could to the upkeep of it and fingers crossed that we'll be given the opportunity to do that uh, TBFI Botswana how many years until our sixth star uh, let me see 55 and it's uh, 56 this year four um, John Buckin not question well you've missed the whole point of this John Question I had, you know, I asked for questions. So that is like the least promising start to a, sent, to, to a thing I've ever read, you know? Hi there, could you give me some questions? This is not a question. How would you feel if I came to your work and did that? And you said, this is what I do for a living. And I said, right, well, this is not that. You'd be annoyed, wouldn't you? I'm just fucking with you, John. Uh, today showed Scottish football in all its shambles of structure, but deep down I was relieved the game was off for injuries with the state of the pitch and I did not have a good feeling. I had a feeling it was a game too much. Graham McCallan, where do you feel the main areas are that need strengthening in the summer? Do you think that Sterling's ability and willingness to play any mirror ultimately limit his chances when Clement falls those positions? I'll see you on Thursday evening in Leicester Square. Yes, yes, come and see us Thursday night. Last few tickets available to come and see us with Paul Gascoigne this Thursday, Leicester Square in London. Go to the Leicester Square uh, Theatre website on Google. Just Google it and tickets are there. Uh, yeah, um... Striker, <laughs> I won't shock you. Uh, striker, definitely, categorically, I think we need to, to bring in. Um, look, the thing about Dessels is, and I see this debate going on a lot, where people go, he's not very good enough, people go, aye, but look, he's not good enough to be our number nine. But he's all we have at the moment, realistically, him and Silva, so we need him right now. Um, but come the summer, we need an upgrade. It's it's not even up for debate, I think, right? And People can point to Dessels has got no, and he has, absolutely, but we need strikers we can trust, and unfortunately for Surreal, you never know what you're going to get, so not not for me, um, and I'd be moving him on and bringing somebody in. Now, where else in the squad? I think wing, I think we could do with, with um, more competition in the wide areas. Um, I think that that's a place that I'd, I'd like to see strengthened. I think we will need a centre-back, Um I, you know, we'll need to wait and see if Goldson's form dip is a permanent thing, uh, or if it's something he'll recover from. And although Suter's been regular, I don't think he's nailed it down where you go, that's his position. Davis I'd be getting rid of in the summer. Balligan probably won't get a new deal, you never know, but probably not. So I think centre back is a key area as well. Um I wouldn't be looking to get rid of Yilmaz, but if bids come in, realistic bids, you know, five million would have seen him gone in January, I ain't selling him for double that now, so I would certainly be be happy there. Uh, uh, Gordon, uh, oh, oh, and on Sterling, sorry, just before I move on, Graham, uh, it can happen, there's no doubt about that, it can happen to player, but I also think with Sterling that he's good enough that the manager might say, although I might need to move you, given injury, and you hope we never have a fucking injury crisis like us again, um, I like him as a midfielder a lot. I think that he's that as a central midfielder. I think he gives you an athleticism that none of our other centre midfielders have. And I think you saw in the cup final in particular how effective that is. And therefore, that's where I'd be choosing as his position. Um, handy boy to have about though, isn't he? Gordon Masterton, looking around the squad, where do you feel we have cover from the younger players? McCausland has done well in a position with no clear start on. Devine has done well at Motherwell. McKinnon has looked promising in CM. Not sure on Yafiko at left back, but also see some young players make the 15 plus game mark next season. Also, any ideas of Connor Barnes as a done deal? Nano Whispers on it. Um, with, with Aberdeen, that's not surprising if if he has signed for us then it will be kept really quiet for the obvious reasons up there but nothing has come out of Rangers on that either uh yeah I'd, I'd like to see us 
um, push forward with uh, Bailey Rice. The manager says he's got a lot to learn. I think that we were maybe given a false impression by Bale about how close he was. But he's very talented. I'd like to see him start to, to make his way to the side. Cole McKinnon, when I've seen him, has shown that he could contribute as well. And Ross has come in and done pretty well as well. Uh, Zach Lovelace, I don't think it's far off, but at fitness, it's, we need him to be fit and ready and, and playing. Um, so yeah, he's he's the one for me. Stephen L, not a question, just my thoughts. Uh, I don't get it's a good thing the game being off. It means now another midweek game in Dundee, probably the Wednesday before we play them. Yes, the squad are down to the bare the bone, but games in hand are wild when it comes to running. I go back to my point earlier. Might be true, might not be, but it doesn't matter because the game was postponed and we now have this game, so we need to get on with it. Um, you know that. That's always my take on things. There's no point complaining. You just need to get up and get on with it. We're British, aren't we? That's that's the British thing. We just go oh, for fuck's sake and get on with it. That's that's our mentality. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that that's kind of it. Needs to be done. Uh, Chris question that we've kind of answered Robert Thorburn uh, with strict liability rearing its head again what are your thoughts can you penalise offensive chance when the term is subjective and are hurty words worth, uh, hurty words worth than throwing court screws at your opponents has this been brought up because Hibs need a diversion from their performance on the park and lack of discipline it's an easy win for Hibs yeah um, and I think more than just us have actually noted the hypocrisy of Hibs um, getting involved in it in terms of strict liability, it'll never happen. Clubs won't vote for it because if you take strict li- liability to its you know, logical conclusion, then it's it's basically anything to do with your club. So if somebody was singing in the city centre something offensive and videos get posted in social media, you could be your club could be punished for it. So it's it's a nonsense. I always feel it's a little bit much that. Uh, that that football clubs are expected to be vigilantes and police things when you have the police there who can do that anyway. So for me, it, it 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 it's just a pantomime, isn't it? You know, people who are genuinely losing sleep over this tend to be, in my experience, hypocrites because they tend to be fairly one-eyed in it. Uh, well, well, what we chant isn't offensive, but what you chant is really offensive, and it's pish. You know, I mentioned this on on our daily show on Patreon. If you want to have a grown up conversation about this, and that means that uh, if you are coming to the table, you say, Look, we want to do something about what we consider offensive, and that includes our own supporters who do this. But no, none of the clubs will do that. So, again, it's just a pantomime. Um, and it lets people in Scotland, I've mentioned this a hundred times, they can justify their own hate by claiming that the reason they hate other people is because those other people are bad people because they do something nasty. When in fact, if those people wanted to see a real bigot, they just needed to look in a mirror. Final one from Kev Roberts. Could the game not have been played on Dundee United's pitch yesterday? Uh, okay, I kind of joke, but if the pitch was playable, what sort of punishment should Dundee get? Uh, yeah, mentioned earlier, um, I think... Uh, You'd be looking at fines first, moving up to point deductions later. Right then, folks, that will do me for this week here on Heartland. There'll be no flagship next week because obviously there is no game being international week. But Cammy will return at the end of next week with Heart and Hand Extra. Meanwhile, though, Martin will be here with Dominant, his epic look at uh, the Rangers uh, 86 to 98. We'll be with you. And of course, one last uh, shout out for our show in London this Thursday night, Leicester Square Theatre, Heart and Hand with Paul Gascoigne. And we're all very, very much looking forward to it. So thank you for listening to me today. Uh, thank you to our chief execs for these questions. If you want to become one and you want to sign up and get involved in stuff like this for the future, then go to patreon.com forward slash heart and hand and sign up for as little as just £2 per month uh, on the basic tier. Right. Thank you to our producers in London, Mike Lee and Paul Myers. Thank you to you for listening. I'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.